in our study today, as we get ready to go into resurrection celebration or Easter this coming up Sunday, we want to think about Jesus on the cross this evening. And one of the best ways for us to figure out what was really happening on the cross is to either look at the things that he said from the cross, which is what we're going to do, or look at the things that happened around the cross, like the earthquake and the darkness, which we'll do at another study. Too much to do in one study, but we want to look at the things that Jesus said. And I think that we're going to learn some powerful lessons about how we live for Christ and how God wants to work in our lives. Now, these last words of Jesus are significant. I think the last words of anybody, they are significant, but these are significant because he said them from the cross, first of all. Just the, the, the suffering that comes from the cross and the fact that this is Jesus, who there's no one like him in all of history, no one who has taught like him, no one who has impacted the world like him, the love, the compassion that he had, the ministry that he demonstrated for three years, and then being betrayed and denied, falsely convicted, and then beaten, and then crucified. That's all a tragedy that he went through and that he speaks these words from the cross. And I want to remind you that Jesus said, no one takes my life from me but I lay it down of my own accord. So even though all of those things happened to them, and that's the way in which they happened, it was Jesus's plan always to sacrifice his life for each one of us. Now, the words were significant because they were his last words of his life in ministry. He had his life in ministry at a beginning and a middle, and here is the end, and he is on the cross, but also that this is the end of his ministry is significant. These words are significant because it is Jesus who is saying them. And as I said, there's no one like him ever. There's no one who taught like him. There's no one who lived like him. And that makes us want to listen to these words all the more. Now, oftentimes, last words of people are profound and sometimes they're a little funny. Bob Marley, the great musician, when he passed away, said money can't buy love. And I think that's a bit of insight on his part. Oscar Wilde, the poet and author, playwright, passed away in 1900 in a hotel. His last words let us know how he felt about the wallpaper in the room. He said, this is his last words, either that wallpaper goes or I do. <laughs> Just so happened those were his last words. Beethoven said, friends applaud, the comedy is over. Remember that when plays were written, they were either a tragedy or a comedy. You don't think of a comedy the way that we, you, you think of a happy ending or a tragic ending. So a comedy was something with a happy ending. He said, friends applaud, the comedy is finished. The last words of Jesus are the most profound last words ever spoken. And by what Jesus did, that doesn't surprise us at all. You know what else doesn't surprise me? That there are seven statements that he makes from the cross. The number seven you find in the scriptures over and over again. It is the number of completeness. And it's like he's finishing things up. He's wrapping things up in a complete way from the cross. So I'm going to try to go. I'm going to try to do this in, in as much of an order as I can. You remember that Jesus was crucified around 9 a.m. in the morning. That at noon, a darkness fell over the earth. There was like, like as, as the wrath of God was upon Christ, it's like the, dark, the God darkened the world and Jesus focused in on, the, on what he was doing in paying the penalty for sin. Because remember, the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And so Jesus has to, the perfect lamb of God dies in our place, paying the wages for our sins. And then for the next three hours, he hangs on the cross in this agony until he finally says his final statements. So we don't exactly know the exact order of it, but we're going to try to get as close as we can. We know the first words that Jesus spoke from the cross, and that is, Father, forgive them. As they began to crucify him, he prayed for the very people who were crucifying him. In fact, his prayer may have been more than just for the Roman soldiers. It may have been for the Roman soldiers. It may have been for, for, for Pilate who condemned him. It may have been for the Jewish leaders that had condemned him, that Jesus prayed this prayer. But in Luke 23, 32 through 34, it says, 
there was also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and they cast lots. And that reminds us so much, as it's going to later on, of Psalms 22, where we find these prophecies that are spoken of actually being fulfilled out of that passage. But this is in the continual. He didn't say, Father, forgive them one time. He said, Father, forgive them several times. And when I think of these soldiers crucifying Jesus, and I think of what they must have heard and endured when they had crucified people. Rome crucified a lot of people. They used it as a deterrent for people rising up against Rome. And this detachment of men, no doubt, had crucified people before. Maybe they heard people curse as they were being crucified. Or maybe curse at them or plead with them or bribe them. But I don't think they ever had anyone say, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And here we have a powerful lesson on a teaching that Jesus gave us, that we have to forgive people. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's a pretty heavy statement. We also know in the Lord's Prayer that we pray, Father, forgive me as I forgive those who have trespassed against me. There could be those who are crucifying you. I use air quotes for those who are listening. To those who are crucify you, that you have to forgive. When someone offends us, when someone hurts us, when someone does something wrong to us, they owe us a debt. There's a debt that we, we, we mark against them. And we're supposed to forgive that debt. We got to let it go. Now, we're not talking about made up things. We're, we're not saying, listen, you have to forgive the people who have offended you, but not real bad ones. Because people sometimes will say, well, you don't know this person really hurt me. They really offended me. Y yeah, I know. People have really hurt me too. And unfortunately, I've really hurt people. And so God has to forgive me because of the work of his son. And we forgive because we have been forgiven. Because if we don't forgive when we've been forgiven, we end up being hypocrites. We are then the hypocrite who says, I can't forgive them for what we've done, not realizing that we have been forgiven much. So Jesus told the parable of the man who was forgiven a great debt, went out and grabbed a guy by the neck that owed him 50 bucks and said, pay me every last penny. When the guy said the same thing he said to the guy that he owed more money to, be patient with me, I'll pay you everything back. He threw him in debtor's prison. The one who had forgiven him had him rearrested and thrown in debtor's prison as well because he had that hypocrisy. Now, when we're talking about forgiveness, we could be talking about someone who's done something really horrible to you. And you say, I get this often after I'll do a teaching on forgiveness. I, I, I can't think I can forgive them. Not after what they've done. Remember, first of all, we're talking about forgiveness, not necessarily restoration. You don't have to put yourself back in a position where you're taking advantage of a person that you forgive. So when you forgive them, it doesn't, you, you still have to be responsible and you don't want people in your life that are gonna be, to use a modern day term, that are gonna be toxic. So you get to choose who's in your life, but you do have to let them go. You have to forgive them. You have to let the debt go. You have to say, and if you need to do it, say it a, a, a verbal to God. Father, I forgive them for what they did for me. I let it go. If Jesus could forgive those who are crucifying him, he's giving us an example that when people are truly and really hurting us, that we need to forgive them. Now, the second thing that he says on the cross has to do with someone else as well. Think about this. He's having nails driven through his hands and feet into his flesh and into that tree. And he's thinking about the soldiers, at least, who are crucifying him. That's pretty amazing. Not only does he think about the soldiers, but he ends up thinking about the criminal that is next to him. The next thing that he says is today, you will be with me in paradise. We find this in Luke chapter 23 as well, 35 through 43. There are two thieves that he's crucified with 
and the people around him are mocking him. This is foretold in Psalms 22 as well. And for homework, if you want to learn more about what was going on on the cross, then read Psalms 22, written by David a thousand years before, uh, a thousand years before the time of Christ, that gives a first person account of a crucifixion. Not only is it a first person account of a crucifixion, it is Jesus. And what, it starts off, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and Psalms 22 ends with, it is finished, or you have done this. It is what Jesus went through in the first person on the cross. And so he's being mocked and the, the thieves mock him as well. But finally, one of them starts to mock Jesus again. If you're the son of God, then come off the cross. And the other thief says, don't you fear God? We are here in this state justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. So something about Jesus's interaction on the cross, maybe the prayers for forgiveness up to this point, causes this man to realize that there's something special here. Also above Jesus's head, Pilate has put king of the Jews. And so the crucified man then speaks to Jesus. The only one that we know that spoke to him on the cross and said, remember me when you come into the kingdom. The only person that we know of who said, remember me in the afterlife. And Jesus said, today, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. This is, this is what the cross is all about. Salvation. This is a soul who comes to Christ while he's giving his life for our sins. And when you have said, Lord, I'm done living for myself. Forgive me and come into my life. I want, you, I want to follow you. I want to serve you then Jesus's response is just like it was to that man on the cross. When we believe and receive, we end up being saved. And so he is saved. Now, just a little side note on that statement. Um, you could put a comma in and make it say something slightly different. You could say, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. Or I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. So you see the difference? So one is saying, I'm making a statement today and you're going to be with me in paradise. The other one is that you're going to be in paradise today. And this is something that theologians argue about whether or not there should be a comma there uh, in that particular statement. But it's a, it's a picture of salvation. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. That's what this thief did in his own way by saying, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. There may be a different way that you say it to God when you surrender your life to him, but you know what's happening. Even listen to our job as Christians. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Now then we are ambassadors of Christ, which I love that being our title. I love that we're the light of the world, but that we are called by Paul ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's what this thief on the cross did, was reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what happened to that thief on the cross. Jesus became sin who knew no sin and the wrath of God abided on him. And the man felt righteousness, was righteous, was something he had never experienced. Jesus never experienced sin. Suddenly he became sin. Now he becomes righteousness after that. So the first statement, caring about the soldiers. The second statement, not thinking about where he's at and what he's going through, but caring about the, the thief who's next to him. The third statement is like it as well. He looked down at the foot of the cross and he saw his mother whose child had been beaten falsely accused. If you women could put yourself in that position of seeing your child go through such a thing, as a parent, I, I can. It would be so tragic knowing that it's final. He's nailed to the cross. What she must be going through, the agony she must be going through. And so Jesus now doesn't think about himself again. He looks down and he thinks about her and in John 19, 25 through 27, it says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. 
and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cloopas, and Mary Magdalene. That's a lot of Marys, by the way. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is the way that John referred to himself in the book of John, the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. And it's interesting that John stays in Jerusalem for a long time. You got to look to other places in the Bible to find that. But you find that when Paul goes back to Jerusalem, that John is still there. So John stays there taking care of Jesus's mother. Now, there's a few things that I think we can learn here. Number one, that even when we're going through pain and difficulty and struggles and hardships, maybe even the most difficult thing that we ever face, that we realize that other people are going through difficulties as well. Maybe even as a result of what we're going through. In 2012, when my late wife passed away, I saw her enduring the suffering that she endured, coming to the end of her life and all the agony that was there with the pain of the cancer. But I also saw her concern for her friends, for her children, for me, that she not only thought about herself in the midst of that, but she thought of others. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. And maybe that's, that is the powerful lesson that we learned from this, that we are to think of other people when we're, we're really going through it, that it's not just focusing in on ourselves, that this is really what we're called to. Now, he's also taking responsibility. He's dying and he wants things to be something, something he's responsible for, his mom. He wants her to be taken care of. And maybe we think about making sure that, you know, if I die tomorrow, do I have everything in order to make it less hard on, on those who lose me? Maybe for some who would be happy, but for those who would lose me, that I would take time to make sure that things are in order. So Jesus here, knowing he's going to die, he puts things in order and he has this compassion for his mother. So from the cross so far, and we're going to, we'll say that these all happened in the first three hours of hanging on the cross. So far, he has cared about those crucifying him, the thief next to him, and his mom, rather than thinking about himself. What a lesson for us in the way that we're to live and that we are not to be self-reflective. Doesn't mean there's not a time for it as we're going to get to that. Pretty soon this is going to get so intense that he gets swallowed up in all of this. When this darkness happens, and this happens when you go to the fourth statement. In the fourth statement now, he turns to himself. He's no longer dealing with people around him, but he turns to himself. And he quotes Psalm 22, 1. It says that darkness, well, let me read this to you. This is Matthew 27, 46 through 49. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? By the way, that's Aramaic that's written in. So the New Testament was written in Greek. That was Aramaic. Jesus cried out. And some who stood there, when they heard him said that, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. See if Elijah comes to serve him. So why did Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This has been a question again that theologians and Christian leaders have debated over the years. Some believe that he was quoting Psalms 22, 1, so you would connect that to what happens to him here. That he quoted it, so you'd go to Psalm 22, 1, and you would read what happens. And there's some very powerful stuff uh, that's there as he does that. I don't think that's what was happening. I think Psalms 22 is a prophecy of what was going to happen to Christ on the cross. And we're getting that first person view from Psalm 22, which is an amazing thing anyway, that you're getting a first person account of a crucifixion because you don't survive crucifixion. But there's a first person account of it in Psalms 22. And this is what Jesus quotes. But I think that Jesus was going into shock. He had been beaten all night. He'd been scourged which some people did not survive. The loss of blood would have been tremendous. And along with that, his body going into shock. And I think he was going into shock. And I'm no, I'm, I'm no uh, medical expert, right? 
So if you're here and you're in the medical field, just be a little gracious with me if I explain shock wrong, all right? Because I looked it up today and I thought, this is more complicated than I thought. So what happens with shock, as far as I understand it, is that when you get to a point where you've lost a lot of blood or an injury and a, uh, uh, a mental shock is a little bit different, you can have an emotional or mental shock as well when something happens. But this is if you're, you're injured bodily and you've lost blood, that your body immediately tries to conserve your major organs, your heart, your lungs, that which you need to live. And so it constricts the blood flow from around the, the, the perimeter of your body. And because of that, your brain lacks some blood flow and you get foggy. Now, when you're injured and you go into shock and you're dying, this can be somewhat of a blessing if you're dying because it takes away the, the, the harshness of the reality when your mind kind of fades away. But Jesus, I think, went into shock and suddenly thought, why have you forsaken me? Why am I here? It speaks of his humanity, that there's Jesus in his divinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in persons, one in essence, and the Son now hanging on the cross in all of his divinity, none of it has gone away. Not even when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wrath of God is on him, but the divinity of the Son is intact. He never stopped being the Son, God the Son. He remained God the Son. And so while he's hanging there on the cross, he suddenly senses that separation. One artist put it this way, the father turned his face away. I don't know if that's a good description of what was happening exactly when Jesus became sin, took our sin and, and felt a distance from the father. Maybe it's as simple as this. When we sin, we feel at a distance from him. We feel compelled to go to him and say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry, so that we can be reunited. But in fact, when I sin, have I been separated from, from God who saved me and died for me? I hadn't lost my salvation, so God was still with me, but I certainly felt a distance from him because of my sin. Maybe you've experienced the same thing. In fact, I think if you're honest, you have. And maybe that's as simple as what he was going through. That he's thinking, my God, but why have you forsaken me? He's just in the midst of this. He's human. This is his humanity. It's speaking of his humanity, that Jesus literally became a man to go through these things with us. Listen to what he says in Psalms 22, 21 through 22. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And if, if, I, were gonna, if I were in charge of the layout of scriptures in a version of the Bible, I would put a, I'd put a hard stop there, right in, in that part of the verse. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Then the next thing it says is, you have answered me. I'd put that on a line by itself. And then he goes on to say, this is the person being crucified. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So you see what happens there in Psalms 22? He's going through everything up until verse 22. He's going through everything he's going through. You can go and you can read it yourself. But at the end of verse 22, he says, you have answered me. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Through the course of what he's going through, Jesus now has revealed why he's going through it. You've answered me. And the next line, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Why am I going through this? Because I'm doing it for Israel. Now, if you continue to read Psalms 22, you see that he also talks about Gentiles and I will go to the nations. And then he talks about a people who have not yet been born. Jesus was thinking of the Jewish people who would be forgiven by what he did on the cross, the Gentiles who would be forgiven by what he did on the cross, and you and me, a people not yet born, it says in the end of Psalms 22, that he has done this, that God has saved all of these people through the work of what Jesus went through at the cross. So why did he cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he felt forsaken. It's, it's, and if Jesus cried out to God, then you can too. When you feel, when you feel like you're, you're frustrated or confused or you don't know why things are happening, you can call out to him. 
Now, there's some respect here. He doesn't lose respect when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He calls him his God twice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can be respectful in pouring our hearts out to God, but God's big enough to, to take what we say to him and God could answer you in the same way he answered Jesus. It's a prayer. And Jesus said, if you pray, God said, call out to me and I will answer you. Now, the fifth thing that Jesus said is, I thirst. This is John 19, 28 and 30. After this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished. So we're, we're very near the end here. That scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled it on a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and they put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now the very fact that the one who would stand up in the temple and cry out, if anyone thirsts, then come unto me and I will give you living water. Jesus said, if you're weary, come unto me. If you realize that you have a need, you're weary, you're tired, you're thirsty. Jesus became weary, tired, and thirsty for you. The very one that the one who can satisfy your thirst spiritually and can give you fulfillment in your life became thirsty and, and drank here. Now we also have him not saying, I'm not gonna drink of this cup until I, I do it in the kingdom. This isn't wine. This is sour wine. This isn't the kind of wine that you would have at a meal. That would be in another place. The fact that Jesus refused it at the beginning of the crucifixion process, because the sour wine would be some kind of an anesthetic, not very a good one, but some kind. But here at the end, he accepts it. Fulfilling scripture, by the way. Because in Psalm 22, he says, my tongue clings to my jaw. Thirst can be one of the strongest. It, it, is the, one of the, it is the strongest drive we have. I guess air, breathing is the strongest drive we have. And after that thirst, it's strong when you are thirsty. And Jesus faced everything that you and I face. He then said, it is finished. Totelestai. The work of laying down his life for our sins was done. This is where Psalms 22 ends with the words, that he has done this. It is finished. He knows the race that he's run has come to an end. The cross has put an end to the law and the prophets, not because he was setting the law aside. Remember, Jesus said not one jot or tittle of the law will be done away with until it is fulfilled. His death on the cross fulfilled the law. He was the high priest offering the sacrifice. He was the lamb of God, giving his life for us so that you and I could be forgiven. The law was completed. He paid the debt. He came as a baby to die. There's a passage in Hebrews that says, a body you have made for me. There's a body made for Christ so he could become a man, so he could live a perfect life without sin, says also in Hebrews that he was tempted in every way you and I are tempted, yet without sin, so he could die that perfect death and he could say, it is finished. All the pain, all the suffering, all the sacrifice. The Bible says he was a man of, of sorrow and grief. Even the sorrow and grief is done. He will now show himself to his disciples after his resurrection and go up into heaven and descend down into hell, which we'll talk about at another time. Second Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us a ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So now we have been reconciled to God and now we go out and encourage other people to be reconciled to God as well. The sacrifice of Jesus is complete. It is enough. There's no sin that cannot be forgiven. Some people wonder why there had to be such brutality. We, we didn't go into the brutality of the cross today. I didn't feel like it was something that we needed to do. Little bagpipes, maybe. 
But other than that, I don't know. Um, I didn't feel like it was something that we needed to do. But sorry, should just let the joke go. <laughs> Lost my train of thought to be funny. That's not the first time that happened, by the way. And so everything is finished now. Jesus has done it all. He's gone through it all and it is done. One more thing. The seventh, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Notice that he says, Father, into your hands. So the son is trusting in the father. As we get to the end of our lives, I think this is an example of our heart and our attitude and maybe even our prayer. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. That no matter what's happening here, we have a heavenly father who takes care of us. That we all have a happy ending. That we may go through some pain and suffering between now and the time that we go to be with the Lord. But in the end, we all have a happy ending that we say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. This is Luke 23, verses 44, then 46 to 49. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, Note that he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breast and returned. And all of his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. No joke this time. Three things in closing. Number one, the cross is about forgiveness. It starts off that way. It's what Jesus went through so we could be forgiven. No wonder he forgave from it. And let's be reminded to forgive people around us. Whether you restore a relationship or not, I don't know. There's a lot involved in that. But what I do know is that you can take whatever that debt they owe you and you can let them go. You can just say, Lord, I, I just, I, I, they don't owe me anything. I think that's one of the best ways. And it's so freeing to say that about someone who hurt you. They don't owe me anything. I let it go. I forgive them. There's such a freedom in that. It might be hard to do. You might pick up bitterness later on, have to do it again. But just let it go. Number two, Jesus lived out Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Maybe you should answer that. I don't know, could it be, yeah, it could be important. Um, Jesus lived out in uh, Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So Jesus being who he is, going through the cross, is focused in on other people. Finally, may we faithfully finish the work that God gives us to do, that we might be able to say in the end, it is finished. The Bible says that we are running in a race. We all run a race. You can't run my race and I can't run your race, but you've got to finish your race. And may you run it in such a way that God would say, well done, good and faithful servant, and that you would be able to say, it is finished. It's interesting looking at 2 Timothy and seeing Paul as he writes his last statements, how he makes similar statements as well that God had brought him to where he finished the race. Stand with me, would you? And let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that we can take time here today to look at this passage, to be spoken to by what we hear here. And we really are moved at how much there is here and how we can really learn and understand these things. And we pray that you would apply them to us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed, please, and your eyes closed for just a few minutes. I'd also like to ask that no one would leave early. We're almost done. We're going to take communion here in a moment. But before we do that, I just want to make sure you have things right with him. So one of the things that the Bible tells us about communion is that we are to, we are to examine ourselves and then drink the cup. So examining yourself right now, have you made a real genuine commitment to Christ? Have you, if you died today, would you wake up in paradise? 
Like, like the thief on the cross? Could you say to him, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom? Could you receive the work that he did for you on the cross that we looked at tonight? Again, the Bible says, as many as receive him, he gives the right to become a child of God to those who believe in his name. Today, would you want to receive him? Say, Lord, I want you in my life. Now, maybe you made that commitment a while ago and you walked away and you know you need to make it right. You need to say to him, I want you back in my life, Lord. I'm done living for myself. I'm sorry that I have been like a sheep that has gone astray, but I'm coming back to my shepherd now and I'm ready to live for him. Going to church can't save you. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There are people who are religious and they go to church. They say, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? He'll say, away from me, I never knew you. These people are convinced that they're, they're right with him, but they're not doing good things. Someone said, it's not good people that go to heaven. It's forgiven people that go to heaven. And you need your sins forgiven. It's like a heavy weight. God said in Isaiah, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. And today you can say to him, Lord, forgive me and come into my life. I know when I prayed that prayer, when I was just a young teenager, God came into my life and transformed me. And no matter how old you are here today, God can do the same for you. So if you want to give your life to Christ today, you're done living for yourself or you want to come back to him, you've walked away from him and you know you got to take care of this, then I'm going to ask you to do something simple but prof with profound meaning for your life. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just raise your hand. Lift up your hand saying, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to Jesus. I want him in my life. God bless you, ma'am. Off to my right. God bless you, sir. Under the balcony. That's great. Anyone else? God bless you, ma'am. That's awesome. Anyone else? God bless you, ma'am. That's great, right by the aisle. Anyone else? God bless you, sir. And God bless you, sir. That's awesome. Just raise your hand now. If you're online and you're watching us, you can say to the Lord, I want you in my life. Just even now, you don't need to raise your hand, but you can say to him, come into my life, Lord. I want to live for you. Anyone else? I'm not going to go on and on. God bless you. All the way back over here. God bless you up in the balcony. All right. You can put your hands down. And I would like everyone, including those who raised their hands, to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess that I've sinned. And I know that my sin separates me from you. But I also understand that I can be forgiven by the death of Jesus on the cross. So I invite you into my life. I turn from my sin that I can live for you, that I can be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. Welcome to the family of God. So excited for you. Now, for those of you who raised your hand, for those of you who are coming to Christ for the first time, you are, you're like a baby Christian and you need to grow and mature spiritually. Now, that's a little Christianese. We call you a baby Christian. The Bible does say that, but not in that way. It doesn't use the term baby Christian. But you need to grow, you need to mature. And we've got a, a packet for you, a Bible and a new believers packet that will help you know now that you've raised your hand, what do you do next? I want to do these things so I grow and mature. One of our prayers for you for, who raised your hand tonight will be that you will be established in Christ. We want to see you established in him, immovable. And if you return to him tonight, then welcome back. I, I walked away from the Lord as well and I returned to him and I didn't come back as a, as a second class child of God. God brought me back into the family and he's bringing you back into the family today. Now, why don't you guys go ahead and take your seats and let's get ready for communion. So here's the first thing that I want to do. I'm going to talk about communion for just a few minutes and then for a very few minutes, then we're going to take communion together. So go ahead and get it ready now. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting more used to these things, by the way. We used to pass out the, the, the stuff, but now we're doing it this way. So just go ahead and take off the clear part there and get the bread out and then go ahead and peel back the thing that looks like aluminum foil, but isn't. I don't know what it is. And go ahead and get that ready. And once you get that off, then go ahead and just put that somewhere. 
so that you got off to the side and now you've got the bread and you've got the cup in your hand, right? So a few things about communion. Number one, this is a memorial meal. It was at Passover that Jesus instituted this, a memorial meal, and remember them being saved from slavery. Now we have a memorial meal that's given to us as Christians that we are to keep until Christ returns. We will, we, the church will take communion until Jesus actually returns and we remember him. What we talked about tonight, we take time to remember by taking communion. This is the only reoccurring ritual that God gave us, communion. Isn't that interesting? So that we would remember the cross because I believe that 2,000 years later, he wanted the cross to be the center of Christianity, not to morph into something else. And as long as we have this picture to remember him, then the cross will stay in the center of Christianity no matter how long Jesus waits to return. If the church goes on for another thousand years before he returns, for a thousand years, the church will be taking communion together and remembering the cross. This is also a symbolic meal. The bread symbolizes his body broken for you. The cup symbolizes his blood that is shed for you. And partaking of them symbolizes us receiving these things that God has done for us. That's why if you're not a Christian today, then you, you don't want to take communion with us because this is something serious. This is something that's powerful and important. And, and if you don't take communion, then just go ahead and put the cup and the, the chair in front of you and don't take it. We'll, we'll collect it later on and we won't judge you. We don't know what's going on with you, but I would rather have you make things right, which you can still do. If you didn't raise your hand, you're thinking now, I wish I, I would have, but you can still make things right by saying, Lord, forgive me. And then you can take communion with us. This is a covenant cup. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The old covenant is done, the law. The new covenant of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving one another as your neighbor is the covenant that we are coming into with him. So when we partake of this cup, we're entering into the new covenant that God has given us through the blood of Christ and living for him. The bread was broken for us. We are proclaim, pro, proclaiming his death until he comes. We are to take it in a worthy manner. And we are to examine ourselves, which hopefully we've done up until this point. And I would like us to all take communion together. So I'll pray and I'll lead us, obviously, when to take the bread and when to drink of the cup. So, Father, thank you that we can gather here together this evening and take communion. What a blessing to remember the Lord's table, to remember the sacrifice that was done for us, that our sins would be forgiven and we could now live for you. And so, Lord, now we take this bread and we eat it now together. Remembering the body that was beaten and crucified and whipped, the crown of thorns shoved on your head, Remembering that that body that was prepared for that purpose, according to Hebrews, is our substitute. And Lord, even though it hurts us to remember what you went through, we're so thankful for the sake of ourselves and our loved ones who know you, that you have forgiven us and given us eternity. And now we drink of the cup together. Lord, thanking you again for the blood that cleanses our sins, the shedding of the innocent blood so that our blood, which is guilty, could be forgiven and that you have now redeemed us, not because we're good, like the thief on the cross who just asked to be remembered. Lord, remember us when you come into your kingdom. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.